Cool. Hello, Stu. How are you? <laughs> I'm very well, thank you. Please introduce yourself for everybody. <laughs> um, so I'm Stu Campbell. I'm like the uh, digital producer slash comic guy on the Ijia Yala project, which is a community cultural development project located in Robin. Uh, in northern WA in the Pilbara region of Western Australia, which is about 2,000 k's north of Perth. Wow, man. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so we're, we're kind of out in the middle of nowhere on this, and um, there's a team of us here, uh, about 10 people here. There's uh, some filmmakers. I've got like a, um, a colouring in assistant, digital sort of guy yeah. assisting me. And um, we've got some music uh, musicians, and all of us kind of work together to create uh, workshops and stuff for the kids. And as a result of those workshops, we produce some um, sort of trying to create some professional sort of products, yeah. including most recently our Neomad Neomad interactive comic for iPad, which is awesome. Just got to say, man. <laughs> Oh great! Yeah, you've checked it out. Cool. Yeah, I have, man. It's it's. I'm damn impressed. But I'll let you continue. <laughs> um, yeah, and bef like even before we did that comic, we um, created a uh, video game called LovePunks.com. It's an online game. I um, I kind of came up here with the intention of just uh, teaching the kids how to make comics, but then they were um, really insane, insanely mad about. Uh, video games, so I kind of had to change the game plan, yep. and said, alright, then let's make a video game, and that was a bit of a learning curve for me, because I hadn't made video games before, yeah. but I wanted, the main thing was that I wanted to include them in it, and so they became the main characters of the video game, there's about 30 kids throughout the game, mm -hmm. and um, they were involved in the process of making that game by, uh, I was teaching them photoshops, uh, Photoshop, and we had to... Um, cut out our own stop motion animations using the animation part of Photoshop and uh, together over four months about 30 kids in after school workshops to help me cut out about 2,000 frames of animation Wowzers. and that was a kind of a good um, repetitive uh, kind of workshop like they had to do the same task again and again and again which is really great for these guys because they hadn't had a lot of computer computer skills before yeah. um, we used Wacom tablets nice. and Wacom pens, yes. Nice. And um, so they got, you know, they got to get used to using the pen, uh, hand-eye coordination, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And just the fact that it was an animation, so you did, you know, each kid had to do ten frames of animation, and that repetitive task meant that they remembered how to use Photoshop. So that when we moved on to creating the comic, they were already pretty um, clued in onto how to use the brush tool, how to use the mask tool, mm. how to use the eraser, how to use the lasso, yeah. and uh, a bunch of, probably about 20, uh, they probably knew about 20 tricks in Photoshop already. Wow. So then when we moved to the comic, um, it became more of an emphasis on colouring, understanding colour, understanding um, lights, when you've got light coming in and how it lights up an object, understanding that it casts a shadow, and um, and and also just being able to uh, follow like a color sampling chart to keep continuity and there's even understanding why continuity is important yeah. you know that was a yes. really cool yeah. thing so they they started to get the gist of that and so in the last couple of months we pulled together Neomad which is a 60 page full color comic and um, you know I can genuinely say that they contributed to about 40 percent of that coloring which is pretty wow. awesome yeah yeah so, um, and then on top of that, you know, they're still, we're making films and we're doing uh, film clips and making music and the kids are all part of that process as well. So, uh, with that comic, kind of one of the, the reasons that I, well, first thing I should say to the listeners or whatever, that um, yeah. the, the interactive comic starts off with a short film yeah. that goes for about two minutes. Um, the reason that we did that short film was I wanted to make it crystal clear that um, you know real people had informed, inspired, and helped co-create this comic. Mm. And what better to, way to show the real people by sort of staging a two-minute um, live-action film with all the all our uh, main kids uh, acting in it? Yeah. So 
that kind of set set the uh, standard for the project, and it's it's also what makes the project really unique. Mm. And those real people um, follow on through to the comic uh, with their voices. So when you tap on a speech bubble in the comic, you'll actually hear the kids' voices, mm. which is pretty funny because they say some really funny stuff. Yeah. And they help to come up with those lines themselves as well. So I sort of threw a story at them. And they bounced back and told me what they would and wouldn't say and what they think was better. They're very critical of everything I do. <laughs> oh, man. So that's project in a nutshell, I'm pretty sure. Wowzers, man. Um, how did you, how did it even get started? Um, you know, uh, f- funding wise as well, how, how, how are you pulling in the resources to keep this sustained? Um, uh, yeah, I probably should have said that. That I'm <laughs> actually working for a company called Big Art. Yep. And um, Big Art's been working um, within Australia in remote uh, uh, kind of isolated communities for the last 20 years. Yeah. Um, they've been talking to the community of Robe and um, uh, they, they started talking to them a couple of years ago, uh, uh, proposing a bit of a project. It was very sort of, uh, you know, vague at that point in time and, you know, just kind of getting an idea of what the community would like to do. Yeah. And um, and they uh, you know they kept in conversation and um, and what's also happening in this area is a lot of mining and stuff is going on. Yep. So um, uh, what passed a few years ago was uh, a federal government agreement that the mining companies had to invest in uh, um, cultural heritage. Uh, the preservation of cultural heritage in the area. Yep. So um, an Aboriginal corporation based in Robin recommended Big Art as a, um, a company to help work with the community to preserve uh, culture and heritage in the area. Oh. So our sort of uh, philosophy um, that we've came up with um, in discussion with the community is, you know, to help uh, Aboriginal people in the area preserve their own culture and heritage in the future. Mm. Uh, the best way is to sort of transmit skills, mm. and I'm kind of doing that by engaging kids in these digital media workshops, you know, in technology that they're going to use in the future, um, whilst also making fun, entertaining products just to sort of get them engaged in it all. Yeah. So that's. Um, that's kind of how the project started and how it's sustained. It's a long-term project, which is really important. It's, um, you know, it's already been going for uh, almost um, three years now. Yeah. I've only been on for one year. There were people before I even came on, wow. and it's going to continue for another two years. Mm. Um, and we're working closely with some of the organisations uh, based in Rome, some of the Aboriginal organisations, mm. and the the purpose is of the like the agenda is that. The skills that we sort of create here and the projects that we get up going, we'll be able to pass on to those guys and help to educate those guys and get them skilled up to be able to maintain them so that mm. the legacy is, uh, is held in the hands of the community, ultimately. Yes. And a big part of that, um, the, you know, that federal government agreement is that uh, they'll build a cultural centre mm. uh, here in Rome in the future. Nice. And, you know, all these things like the video game and the Neomad comic and all the films that we've been making, mm. you know, they'll all, all have a permanent place in that um, cultural centre, no. along with, you know, what all the um, the local guys have been creating off their own backs. Mm. So, you know, it's going to be a pretty rich cultural centre, and that's I think that's forecast for another couple of years away. So we're just kind of in the process of uh, getting busy creating content for it all. Yeah. Um What's the age groups for the kids that you guys work with? Um, most of them about 10, 11, 12 years old um, for the for the love punks and the neo mad stuff. Yeah. Um, and that's uh, that happened mainly because the Robin Price Primary School is just around the corner. Yeah. Um, and um, and they are all real keen. Yeah. And uh, you know all the families. Uh, obviously really stoked about, you know, the extra education and the kids just being involved in these kinds of, kinds of uh, projects. Mm. Also, you know, uh, from a, you know, first impression point of view, mm. you get all, all this great sort of documentation of your kid growing up, like the films and stuff. It's yeah. really cool just to see them on the screen and, you know, see them having, having a blast and saying all these funny 
saying all these funny things yeah. in the story. And, and, and there's like a couple of music videos where they're dancing around and playing, playing musical instruments and stuff like that. So, yeah. you know, everyone's happy. And what we do um, at the end of every project, whether it's a one week long project or uh, a bigger project, you know, every couple of months we'll have like a community launch party. We'll just show the community what we've been up to, what we've created. Um, myself and some of the other crew will work with the kids to sort of hold that little launch party yeah. and present all the work to the community and, and then we'll burn all the videos and stuff onto DVDs and hand them out and you know everyone gets to own a piece of all of the work that we do. Very nice, man. Um, now, uh, what's the internet access like for the community there? Um, is it available uh, for everybody or not so much? Well, not everybody has computers. Yeah, so I was even like um, wondering about that. How, when you guys started the project, did kids already have a basic knowledge of computers or did you have to teach them from scratch? Uh, well, no, I was actually I was pretty fortunate. There was a really great teacher in the school there who um, was already teaching them some stop motion animation and they had a pretty good computer set up in, at the school. Nice. Um, before I had even met that guy, though, you know, I had a kind of a, um, a digital agenda. You know, it's uh, a, a lot of like some of the problems here is, or anywhere in Australia in isolated communities, is these places are the last places on the map to get mm. uh, the technology, to get the cutting edge stuff, to even be connected like the rest of Australia is. Mm. So, kind of by um, having our digital tech sort of at the cutting edge as much as possible is a really important statement for us to so so show that you know these kids deserve to have access to that technology for starters, yeah. and that when they are given that access to that sort of technology, they can create really amazing things. Mm. So we we kind of like even to release NeoMad on the iPad might seem like a bit of a mad idea because not many people have iPads, mm. but again, you know, iPads are kind of like the Everybody's talking about iPads at the moment. Yeah, they are a really great way to read stories on any technology, like any platform. Yeah, and um, and then you know, since we sort of started proposing that as the platform, the school went and invested in ten iPads. So nice. now it is accessible uh, to the community, and having the having you know products on the iPads that the kids have helped create, you know, it's a bit of an incentive to go to school and check it out. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's all kind of starting to make sense now. I was a little bit concerned at the beginning, like yeah. when I started. Yeah. Like I wasn't sure, I, I wasn't confident. I, I kind of, you know, the last thing that I wanted, like, well, I didn't want for the community not to be able to experience their own... Creation. <laughs> yeah, creations. You know, I was really worried about that. But um, we've also <laughs> discovered that uh, all these families of the kids that have been involved have started uh, going out and buying iPads as well. <laughs> uh, it kind of makes sense because iPad you can get for like 400 bucks and yep. it's so much cheaper than a computer. Yep. So, and then what we've been doing, we've got uh, 10 iPads sitting out on the couch there from, uh, from the school and from community members and we've just been um, installing all this cool shit on our iPads for them. Yep. You know, books, uh, music apps, all this free stuff which, you know, really great. And I, I'm sort of starting to realise that from the, what a kid can possibly do on a computer, you can do on an iPad. So yep. it's become, it's, it's all sort of come and, you know, surprised me and been all for the best. Yep. Yeah. Well, man, um, have you heard of the uh, Hole in the Wall project by any chance? I don't think so. It's it's an old like I had um, come across that project when I was in in high school, and um, it's essentially this um, one guy from India who uh, believed that the rural poor um, could educate themselves in technology, and um, he he put all these um, computers inside the walls of slums in slum areas, and um, he tr he wanted to prove to the governments that um, it would be a worthwhile investment. Um, to start giving technologies um, that are up to date, like you're saying with the iPads, because these um, usually neglected communities, um, they can leapfrog, you know, the digital divide. Mm. Um, so they were finding that, you know, a lot of people were skipping um, landline phones as well and going straight to mobile phones. So a lot of the people from the rural yeah, areas, yeah, yeah. you know, um, it's crazy how that's happening. But it's a very positive sign. Yeah, that's, yeah, that. That's a you know really good point. Yeah. 
yeah, these guys have kind of skipped the computers and gone straight to the iPads. That's promising. That's promising. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, also, I also found like that iPad because it's a mobile technology. Um, you know, we had one, at one of those community launches. You know, we had a bit of a fire going on, and all the kids were sitting around the fire on their iPads. And for me, and one of the grandmas uh, of some of the kids we work with, mm. you know, she was just so happy. She'd never seen her kid on a uh, on a computer before, yep. and they were really into it. They were making, they were playing around on a music app and creating the music on in real time. Yep. And um, she was just flipping out because she had she lived in a, a sort of a remote, um, even more remote community, a bit out of town, mm. and you know, always having trouble with getting the kids to school and stuff like that. And for her, it kind of represented this, you know, this alternative approach where the school was suddenly next to the fire, and yes. they were still learning. And you know, it's kind of uh, the w the Western view of the school was kind of met the Aboriginal school where they like to learn out on the uh, out on the country and stuff like that. So it was yeah. kind of a nice symbolic, poetic little thing that we were witnessing, and uh, yeah, kind of that again made sense. And I was like, oh, you know, another plus for the mobile tech. <laughs> yep, man. Yeah, it's cool. It is, you know, I think the iPads and smartphones they they will be the uh, the new campfire, really, because um, a lot of the storytelling, you know, especially for indigenous cultures, um, happen around the campfire. You know, we we always hear how stories start out, um, but now mobile technologies is kind of bringing the stories through those devices. So, you know, you will see kids um, huddling around an iPad or a smartphone, uh, checking out mm. stuff that, you know, you guys are creating as well, that sort of product. And I think, um, you know, one of the big emphasis uh, for us in the future, and mm. um, it's starting to happen now, is um, translating these stories into language, and then by tapping a button, you can just toggle between English or the native language, which in this area is... Injibani or Nalama or Banjama, yeah. depending where that story comes from. Mm -hmm. And so not only have you got the language preserved in the story, but you've got a, a prompt there to aid that um, young person in learning their own language. Mm. You know, all, all of those Aboriginal languages in Australia are fairly endangered because, yeah. um, you know, the education system has banned them and in integrating them into the schools properly. Mm. And um, there's, there's been a push to bring them back and uh, you know this this approach to bringing it back, I think, is a really effective one. Mm. Just having, um, like I mentioned before, when you tap on the speech bubbles in the comic, mm. and you hear the kids' voices. That on its own really helps kids learn English for a start. Yeah, because they've got the prompt there; they can read along the line and hear the voice saying the line. Um, to, so to apply that to language is, you know, really promising. Yeah. Why do you think that this sort of work is important, not only for current generations, but future generations? Um, well, do you mean like this kind of project or...? Um, yeah, this type of work in, you know, preserving um, uh, cultural stories or the language uh, yeah, 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 digital yeah. work. Um, <clears throat> well, first, you know, it's the livelihood of, of these people. Um, that's in danger. You know, their their history is um, well. I should say, like um, a big reason for this project being funded is um, just around the corner from here is the Barrett Peninsula, which is the largest um, largest area on the planet of petroglyphs, ancient petroglyphs, rock art, uh, rock carvings. Yeah, it's uh, estimated about a million of them on the rocks around here, and um, you know, those are endangered by the encroaching mining industry and that sort of thing. Mm. And, um, you know, what I've repeatedly been told by the older guys in the community um, is that all of their stories for the last 30,000 years are, uh, are archived on these rocks. Mm. And their stories about flora and fauna, the animals from the area, and also like uh, uh, mythology, um, their, their spirits mm. that are connected to their country. But an important point about that being connected to their country is those uh, rocks and where they are located, um, if you move those rocks, you're disconnecting the story from that country. Mm. And, and all of a sudden, it's like, you know, it's like burning down all our libraries mm. and destroying all our history. Yeah. And, you know, 
I, it blows my mind that it's so hard to explain this to bureaucrats <laughs> or whatever. Yep. So that is the the uh, that's you know absolutely important mm. to uh, preserve mm. any person's history to know where we've come from mm. to help us move forward. And and in those stories, there are so many lessons that we could learn on about sustainability. Yes. And about how we treat our country, and all like all of those stories on those rocks are kind of like it's like a legend of a map, mm. and they tell you where water holes are located. You know, they were archiving these things for a reason, not only just to capture the stories, but to be a valuable information source. Yeah. So uh, there are a lot of so much information mm. there that um, you know it's an absolutely fascinating for anyone to come in mm. and sort of hear about mm. and because of the scale of it it should really be regarded uh, in the same respect as as like pyramids uh, the pyramids of Egypt you know yet in Australia no one really knows about it so yep. um, you know that's kind of our agenda as well is just to lift the profile mm. so that it gets the respect that it deserves awesome would you like to see more of these type of projects because there are obviously a lot of Aboriginal communities around Australia um, and, and indigenous groups around the world. Um, would you would it be would you like to see um, this take place um, on a grander scale? You know, in sort of definitely. Like I think it needs to. I think it's Australia's taken way too long to initiate these types of projects. Yeah. Um, it should be happening everywhere. It should be encouraged everywhere. Mm-hmm. And even um, even from the, the point of view of me being a white guy coming into an Aboriginal community, you know that's yeah. you know that's a, that's a new sort of uh, a uh, it, that's prototyping a, a kind of an educational project that I haven't even heard of too much, but needs to happen. You know that's part of the reconciliation that you know it needs to be put at the forefront of just connecting white people with black fellas and sharing stories so that we can all understand their culture and they can understand our culture and try to figure out <laughs> why it's taken so long to, uh, um, to, to find a meeting place which we're both happy with. Yeah. So I sort of figure that's really important. I've learned a lot from the guys hanging out with all these guys here and yeah. you know things that I'll hold, take with me for the rest of my life and it's completely transformed my perspective mm. of Aboriginal communities throughout Australia and um, and how much their culture means to them. Mm. So yeah, I totally um, would and you know, it's a great experience uh, for a white fella <laughs> <Yeah, laughs> to yeah. come. So you know, that's a, you know, that's another reason just to promote it, not only for the preservation of um, Aboriginal heritage but for, for more white fellas to understand it. Yeah. So that, I think that's as important as um, as the project's outcomes themselves. Yeah, agree. You know? Yeah. Because it, in reality, the Aboriginal people in Australia are completely outnumbered. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the more help they can get, the better. Awesome, man. Um, I'm just glad to hear, you know, um, these type of views because, uh, I mean, obviously not everybody is aware um, and uh, this is what I've been sort of promoting uh, just out of my own feeling and my own experiences with my own cultures. Um, every time I've gone to show some of my work, it was always indigenous people who get it, like automatically. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, people like yourself who have worked with indigenous get it. But it's trying to get that across to, to other Westerners um, who are consumed in, you know, the, the Western lifestyles um, to see how important this is, not just for the aboriginals or the indigenous, but for themselves as well. Um, Okay, maybe in closing, um, what are some of the challenges that you've come across or faced um, uh, during the project or, you know, um, living in the remote areas? Um, Well, you know, everything, I'm learning a lot every single day. I'm getting it, but I'm getting more of it as every day progresses. And, um, you know, I've made mistakes. I've, you know, there's jump the gun. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I get excited about ideas and put, throw all my ideas on the fire as well, and yeah. and you know then realise that uh, you kind of like you can't do that, or you you know you're changing the story, or you you're trying to turn it into something it's not, and uh, <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, that, wouldn't that be so cool? And I was like, yeah, it would be cool, but that's not the story we're telling, and you know things like that, um, where you know you can get excited and. Um, 
and find yourself in a sticky sort of awkward situation. But it, but it soon, you know, levels out, and you you understand why, and um, you, you kind of just, I mean, that you know, that's a that's a great sort of learning experience, I suppose, and yeah. kind of um, just. Yeah, I suppose I, I don't know. Like taking my time to to sort of hear uh, hear everyone out. You know, I, I'm I'm kind of used to a sort of a, a hasty speed of production. I kind of come from a commercial background. I always got to pump out the projects and that sort of thing. But this, you know, this project has kind of taught me to that. You know, my deadlines aren't their deadlines, and I've got to slow everything down and. And, uh, take the time to hear their point of view, and I think that's you know a massive mistake that we've all made in Australia. Mm. Um, of just trying to get some sort of something achieved really quickly, mm. and that uh, you know the reality is that nothing is going to be achieved really quickly. And then when you do take the time, you start to understand why mm. you needed to in the first place, and then it's so much more rewarding. Mm. Like I'm just working on this story at the moment, and um, I'll be smashing ahead, drawing all these pictures, and then I'll take them. To the old guy that uh, I'm working with, and he's like, "Oh no, that's wrong," <laughs> <laughs> and I have to go back, and I'll be like, "I'll be totally bummed out that I, you know, that I was doing it again." I'm like, "When am I going to get this right? Uh, does this guy even know what he's talking about? Like, what? I thought it was fine." And then I'd go back, and he's like, "Ah, now you're getting it. You see what you've done here." I was doing this one of this ancient snake, uh, the Walu, in the area, yeah. and. Um, and then I showed him the first time. He's like, oh, "No, that snake looks too young. He's got to have a beard, and he's got to have arms." And I was like, "Man, snakes don't have arms." <laughs> but in the dreaming, the uh, this, this particular story belonged to a really old fella uh, from this area who recently passed away. Yeah. And, um, and the guy that I liaised with about the story he was saying, because when the old fella had the dream, he said the snake had arms, and that allowed the snake to tear out all the trees that were in its path and to dig up the ground and carve where the river was going to go. Mm. And all of a sudden, just in those two sentences, a whole new, you know, amazing landscape appeared before me and just the power of this snake. Mm. I was like, wow, this is, you know, this is a snake that has the power to transform an entire landscape. I've got to really get back to the drawing board. And then mm. my drawings that followed were just, you know, complete chaos and, you know, like a tsunami just taking everything out, you know what I mean? So... Yeah. It brought so much more to it, but I had to sort of go through that long, longer path to get there. Yeah. So that's been, you know, that's been a challenge from the from the artist's point of view. Mm. And I suppose some of the other challenges are like, you know, just this area. It's like we're surrounded by the wealthiest people in Australia. They're all connected to this mining industry, and the, um, you know, the contrast between quality of living is pretty stark and mm. and embarrassing. You know, this community that I'm working with doesn't have nowhere near the uh, resources and the standard of living that 10 k's up the road have. Mm. You know what I mean? And that's depressing. And I kind of, um, and and you know, with that comes all kinds of problems that uh, you know, family problems can generate generate from that. Uh, you know, there's a history that sort of that that has caused this situation, mm. and. Um, and it and it flows on through to the young people that we work with, and you know they didn't get any sleep last night for whatever reason, and you know it's kind of um, without focusing on those negative issues, but you know it's all there in plain sight, and that makes it a bit more challenging. So, you kind of, but it's also you got to try and take what motivation you can from that to try and improve their situations, and you know make sure that they've got a better future for them. And I can completely understand why they wouldn't want to, you know, the unemployment here is those mining companies and that sort of thing and I can completely understand why they wouldn't want to work there when it's digging up all the country that means so much to them so mm. by hopefully providing this kind of education they could be moving into a future where um, the career paths are telling their own stories and, mm. and stuff like that Yeah. so you know but that's you know it's a long term sort of goal and it's and it's going to require a lot of investment from myself and people like me mm. to sort of ensure that happens and just sort of seeing that uh, ahead of me, you know, that can be a bit daunting sometimes, knowing, trying to sort of reevaluate what I'm doing to make it as effective as possible. Mm. Yeah. Awesome, dude. Um, thank you so much. I want to talk more, but I'm going gonna, gonna to keep it to this for now. 
Um, you, we're, we're probably going to talk again. Uh, you, you cool with that? <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's that's great, man. Um, but uh, thank you so much for this. Um, really enlightening. Um, keep doing what you're doing, um, and we'll speak soon. And have fun with the kids today. <laughs> thank you. All right. Yeah, thanks a lot, George. All right, take it easy, Stu. Yeah, catch you, man. See ya. Uh,